Hi everyone, I have got my April Book of the Month Club already. I hope that you guys stick around and join me. Hi everyone, this is Future Me. So, you know, I got that idea from Alicia Martin. I know, she does that sometimes and before her videos or during her videos. Hi, this is Future Alicia. This is Future Nancy. So this video ran a long time. I have no idea how I get so talkative sometimes, but I think it was the review of the circus train. I wanted to do the book justice because I just read so many bad reviews on this, and I think it was one of the favorite books I've read from them, and so I wanted to kind of do it justice. I hope I didn't give too many spoilers out, but anyway, I'm going to put timestamps in this video so that you can kind of skip around, or if you wanted to maybe... Oh, you say, oh my God, I can't take Nancy for an hour. Oh my God, how, how does anyone do that? So anyway, that way you kind of maybe come and go and say, okay, so I did uh, this book, this book, and this book. And uh, today I'm going to listen to this part. Alrighty, so again, sorry for the long video. Sorry for the voice episodes that I'm having. But um, yeah, I hope you guys go out and enjoy. I don't know when this is going to post. So have a great week or a great weekend. Take care, everyone. I love you guys so much, and we'll talk later. Bye-bye. Hi, everyone. I'm Nancy, and welcome back to my channel. I'm so excited to see you guys. It means so much to me that you're able to take a few minutes or an hour or two out of your day to spend with me. It means so much to me, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you're new to my channel, I hope that you would consider hitting that little red subscribe button. I would love to have you come back and join us for a few, <laughs> few. Hi everyone, I'm Nancy and welcome back to my channel. What you just saw was I was, this is my third video that I'm trying to do today and I think I pushed myself a little too hard, so I ended up um, stopping that video and I just went and I took a nap and now I'm awake again so I'm nice and fresh so let's try to start this over again shall we so that is why my wellness journal is so important to me so anyway let's get on with it I think this is going to be a lengthy video I will probably take a few breaks here and there so I'm going to apologize in advance for the kind of scrappiness or whatever it's called when you kind of edit and put things together Alrighty. So anyway, hi, I'm Nancy. Welcome back to my channel. I'm so excited to see you guys. It means so much to me that you guys are able to spend a few minutes of your day with me. It means more to me than I can ever let you know. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. If you're new to my channel, I hope that you would please consider hitting that little red subscribe button over there. I would love to have you come back and join us for future videos. Today we are doing the book of the month club. There are seven books to choose from this month and all of them sounded really, really good. I was going to kind of skip the books that I didn't get and just talk about the one that I did get and then talk about the two books that I read behind me. But you know, if it's something that you're thinking about doing or you maybe you've um, in the book of the month club already and you picked your book, but maybe hearing how the other stories are, maybe that'll make you rethink and put them in your to be our list. Alrighty. So anyway, I made myself a drink while I took a break. Well, I took when I took my break and I made myself a lemon drop. Thank you so much, Christy, for your suggestion of lemon drops. So I just made myself a little one and it's in my yoga class. I thought you said pour a glass. I've got like a sugar lemon rim right here. Had a few sips already just to wet my whistle. So anyway, it's going to be a long video. I think I'm going to need it. Cheers, everyone. Alrighty, so good. So anyway, last weekend we had a blizzard. This weekend, no snow. It rained here and there. And today we hit 60. Tomorrow they say we may hit 70, but it's going to rain. And I think by Wednesday, we're supposed to be about 80 degrees. So much melting going on. Spring is coming. I'm excited. But anyway, let's get into the Book of the Month Club, shall we? So anyway, I'm going to have a link below. Um, it's If you are new to the Book of the Month Club, uh, that first using that link, it's going to get your first book for $5. After that, it's gone up a little bit over the years. I think I started, it was like $12.99, then it was $14-something. 
and now it's up to $16.99 a month and that does include free shipping so that's always a plus and uh, you get a few different books to choose from every month if none of them are appealing it's easy enough to skip sometimes they don't offer you that option you can skip or pick a book and every now and then they'll say oh nothing excited you you can pick from this this and this so anyway there's always lots of options skipping is always an option if you don't feel like reading or like me you're I'm, I'm slow at reading. I'm sorry. I only have like 30 minutes to an hour a night to dedicate to reading. And some nights I just, I just don't get to it. I fall asleep. But anyway, I'm enjoying the books that I have read. So let's get into the books this month. There were seven choices this month. So we had three contemporary fictions. We had one historical fiction. That sounds really good. We had a dystopian. I think that's like a, kind of like a devastation type book or an uh, imaginary world with total devastation, things like that. Um, a thriller and a historical romance, which I really didn't want the historical romance. But boy, did I linger on that book cover picture a while. I almost bought that book just to kind of put by my bedstand so every time I woke up I could look at it. Yeah, when I show the covers during the video, I'll leave it on for a few extra seconds for you as well. Alrighty, so this first book that they uh, picked for us was a contemporary fiction, and it's called Adelaide by Genevieve Wheeler, and it's a raw, wrenching exploration of a toxic relationship in its aftermath, doubles as an ode to the power of self-love. For 26-year-old Adelaide Williams, an American living in a dreamy London, meeting Rory Hughes was like a lightning bolt out of the blue. This charming Englishman was the one she wasn't looking for. Is it enough? Does he respond to texts? Honor his commitments? Make advance plans? Sometimes really and no, not at all. But when he shines his light on her, the world makes sense. And Adeline is convinced that in his heart, he's fallen just as deeply as she has. Then, when Rory is rocked by an unexpected tragedy, Adeline loses everything in her power to hold him together, even if meaning, if meaning losing herself in the process. When love asks us too much of us, how do we find the strength to put ourselves first? With unflinching honesty with heart, this Relatable debut from a fresh new voice explores grief and mental health while capturing the timeless nature of what it is like to be young and in love with your friends, with your city, and with a person who cannot and will not love you back. Alrighty, so our next one is a historical fiction. It's called Hang the Moon by Jeanette Walls. The quick take is this moving prohibition era, family saga and its feisty heroine have all the grit and complexity of good moonshine. Speaking of moonshine, I should really have another sip. My voice is starting to go. Alrighty, so this book is about Sally Kincaid. She's the daughter of the biggest man in a small town, the charismatic Duke Kincaid. Born at the turn of the 20th century into a life of comfort and privilege, Sally remembers little about her mother, who died in a violent argument with the Duke. By the time she was just eight years old, the Duke had remarried and had a son, Eddie, while Sally is her father's daughter, sharp-witted and resourceful. Eddie is his mother's son, timid and cerebral. While Sally tries to teach young Eddie to be more like their father, her daredevil coaching leads to an accident, and Sally is cast out. Nine years later, she returns, determined to reclaim her place in the family. That's a lot more complicated than Sally expected, and she enters a world of conflict and lawlessness. Sally confronts the secrets and scandals that hide in the shadows of the big house, navigates the factions in the family and town, 
and finally comes into her own as a bold, sometimes reckless, bootlegger. Alrighty, so we are back with Romantic Comedy. It's a contemporary fiction by Curtis Sittenfeld. And when I saw the title, I thought, I wonder if that's the story. And there's a movie that I used to watch all the time, and I really loved it. I think I've got it on a DVD downstairs. Not a DVD. What was the VH VHS downstairs? So anyway, it's not going to play any place that I have. But it was Dudley Moore and I think Mary Steenbergen. Oh, my gosh. I love that movie. It was so, so good. But anyway, it's not what this is about at all. All righty. So two minutes to show time. Romance, check. Comedy, check. Midlife crisis, workplace antic, big feels, and feminism, check. All righty, so Sally Mills. And you know, and I love the name right off the bat. I know I go, I go off on these tangents. They spell her name M-I-L-Z, and that is how my mom spelled her maiden name, Mills, M-I-L-Z. All righty, so Sally Mills is a sketch writer for the night owls the late night live comedy show that airs each saturday with a couple of heartbreaks under her belt she's long abandoned the search for love settling instead for the occasional hookup career success and a close relationship with her stepfather to round out a satisfying life but when sally's friend and fellow writer danny horst begins dating Annabelle, a glamorous actor whose guest hosted the show. He joins the not-so-elusive group, group, not group, yeah, not, well, maybe that comes later in the story, who knows. Alrighty, a glamorous actor who guest hosted the show. He joins the not-so-exclusive group of talented but average-looking and even dorky men at the show and in society at large who's gotten romantically involved with the incredibly beautifully and accomplished women. Sally channels her annoyance into a sketch called The Danny Horse Rule, poking fun at this phenomenon while underscoring how unlikely it is that the reverse would ever happen for a woman. Enter Noah Brewster, a pop musician sensation with a reputation for dating models who signed on as both host and musical guest for this week's show. Dazzled by his charms, Sally hits it off with Noah instantly. But as they collaborate on one sketch after another, she begins to wonder whether there might actually be sparks flying. But this isn't a romantic comedy. It is real. It's real life. And in real life, someone like him would never date anyone like her, right? Alrighty, so our next one is that dystopian one. And it's called Camp Zero by Michelle Min Sterling. Don't be fooled by the floating sillies and brain implants. This mysterious polar camp riven by inequality is no utopia. In the far north of Canada sits Camp Zero, an American building project hiding many secrets. Desperate to hold her climate-displaced Korean immigrant mother, Rose agrees to travel to Camp Zero and spy on its architect in exchange for housing. She arrives at the same time as another newcomer, a college professor named Grant who is determined to flee his wealthy family's dark legacy. Gradually, they realize there, there is much more to the architect than previously thought, and a disturbing mystery lurks beneath the surface of the camp. At this time, rumors abound of an elite group of women soldiers living and working at a nearby Cold War era climate research station. What are they doing there? And who is leading them? An electrifying page turner when nothing is as it seems. Camp Zero cleverly explores how the intersection of gender, class, and migration will impact who and what 
is a surviving in a warming world. Oh my god, that sounds good. That sounds like a nice thriller, a nice mystery. I might have missed the boat on this one. I might have to get this one. So if you got this book, I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Alrighty, so now we have another contemporary fiction. This one is called Advika and the Hollywood Wives, and it's by Kirthana Ramazetti. Get a big bowl of popcorn ready. We've got it all year. Old Hollywood glamour, scorned lovers, paparazzi, found family. At the age of 26, Advika Sarensen considers herself a failed screenwriter. To pay the bills and keep her mind off the recent death of her twin sister, she's taken to bartending A-listing events, including the 2015 Governor's Ball, the official after-party of the Oscars. There is a cinematic dream come true. She meets the legendary Julian Zelding, a film producer as handsome as Paul Newman and ten times more powerful. Fresh off his fifth Best Picture win, despite their 41-year-old age difference, Advika falls helplessly under his spell, and their evening flirtation ignites into a whirlwind courtship and elopement. Advika is enthralled by Julian's charms and luxurious lifestyle. But while Julian loves to talk about his famous friends and achievements, he smoothly changes the subject whenever his previous relationships come up. Then, a month into the marriage, Julian's first wife, the famous actress Evie Lockhart, dies and the tabloid reports a shocking stipulation into her will. A single film reel and one million dollars will be requested, bequested to Julian's latest child bride on one condition. Advica must divorce him first. Shaken out, shaken out of her love fog and still simmering grief, over the loss of her sister, and uneasy about Julian's sudden, inexplicable urge to start a family, Advica decides to investigate him through the eyes and experience of his exes. From reading his first wife's biography, to listening to his second wife's confessed albums, to watching his third wife's Real Housewives SK reality show, Advika starts to realize how little she knows about her husband, realizing she rushed into marriage for all the wrong reasons. Advika used this info gleaned from the lives of her husband's exes to concoct a plan to extravate herself from Julian once and for all. I know that sounds like something modern. It sounds like it could become like a classic. It could be a movie. That one does sound like a really good book. So. If you got this one, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, too. Alrighty. So this, the next one is a historical romance. And some historical romance, I, I used to always read them, and then I just kind of got away from it. But this one, I wanted to buy it just for the cover. I wanted to put the poster up on my bed so I could fall asleep looking at this picture every night. Yeah, and wake up to it. Every morning. Wow. That's sad, isn't it? That's pathetic, do you say? Alrighty, so let's get on with this one. So this is a historical romance. It's Anna Maria and the Fox. And it's by Liana De La Rosa. In this sumptuous, swoony Victorian romance, an eldest daughter struggles with responsibility and the pull of her heart. A forbidden love between a Mexican heiress and a shrewd British politician makes for a tantalizing Victorian season. Anna Maria Luna Valdez has strived to be the perfect daughter, the perfect niece, and the perfect representative of the powerful Luna Familia. So when Anna Maria is secretly sent to London with her sisters to seek refuge during the French occupation of Mexico. She experiences her first taste of freedom, 
far from the judgmental eyes of her domineering father. If only she could ignore the her piercing look she receives from across the ballroom floors from the austere Mr. Fox. Gideon Fox elevated himself from the London gutters by chasing his burning desire for more opportunities, more choices for everyone. Now, as a member of parliament, Gideon's on the cusp of securing the votes. He needs to put forth a measure to abolish the Atlantic slave trade once and for all, a cause that is close to his heart as the grandson of a formerly enslaved woman the charming Vexa Anna Maria is a distraction he must ignore. But when Anna Maria finds herself in the crosshairs of a nefarious nobleman with his own political agenda, Gideon knows he must offer his hand as protection. But will this Mexican heiress win his heart as well? Alrighty, so I ended up taking a little break just to save my strength and carry on. Had a sip of my lemon drop, so thank you, Christy. So anyway, the one I picked was a thriller. It's called The Only Survivors by Miranda, by Megan Miranda. And oh my gosh, look at the cover of this. It looks like a nice beach house on the Cape Hatteras shore or whatever up on stilts. Love the North Carolina shore. Alrighty. So anyway, this is the quick take on that. So a group bound by decades old pact and survivor's guilt reunite at a remote island house in this taut, twisty tale. Seven hours in the past, seven days in the present, seven survivors remaining. Who would you save? A decade ago, two vans filled with high school seniors on a school service trip, crashed into a Tennessee ravine, a tragedy that claimed the lives of multiple classmates and teachers. The nine students who managed to escape the river that night were irrevocably changed. A year later, after one of the survivors dies by suicide on the anniversary of that crash, the rest of them make a pact to come together each year to com commemorate that terrible night, to keep one another safe, to hold one another accountable, or both. Their annual meeting place, an old house on the Outer Banks, has been a refuge, but by the 10th anniversary, Cassidy Cassidy Bent has worked to distance herself from the tragedy and from the other survivors. She's changed her mobile number. She's blocked the other's email addresses. This year, she is determined to finally break ties once and for all. But on the day of the reunion, she receives a text with an obituary attached. Another survivor is gone. Now, they are seven and Cassidy finds herself hurling back towards the group, wild with grief and suspicion. Almost immediately, something feels off this year. Cassidy is first to notice that when Amaya, the annual organizer, slips away, overwhelmed, this wouldn't raise alarm except for the impending storm. Suddenly, they're facing the threat of closed roads and surging water again. Then Amelia stops responding to her phone. After all they've been through, she wouldn't willfully make them worry, would she? And as promised long ago, each survivor will do whatever he or she can to save one another, won't they? All right, so I had to get that one. Our last vacation that we took before we left the East Coast and Rhode Island and moved to Minnesota, we took a camping trip on Cape Hatteras, the Outer Banks, and oh my God, I fell in love with it. It was one of my brother's fam 
not famous, favorite places that he loved to go, even though they had the place on the Jersey Shore that they could go to anytime they wanted. One of the best places, his favorite places he loved to go was Cape Hatteras and just do some fishing and things like that. Well, they were, while we were there, we had our puppies with us, Sir Stetson and Lady Penelope, and we stayed at a campground, but we went to the beaches every day. We got to see the wild horses in the water, and it was just amazing. I love the Outer Banks, but I love a good thriller, so this one just sounded like it was something I just had to get. Alrighty, so I've got two books that I've read from the Book of the Month Club, but I'm only going to talk about one because I'm sure I've gone into overdrive here. So this one is The Circus Train, and it was by Amitka Parika, and I probably said her name wrong, so I'll put that up there. And this had so many terrible reviews that I saw on YouTube, but I really enjoyed this book. I was drawn to it because of the circus, the traveling like circus, and knowing that my parents had worked on the traveling, the carnival, the circuses down in the Appalachian country back in like the late 40s, early to late 50s. And so I've just always been drawn to stories like this. So this is about a traveling circus that's in Europe set during right before and then during World War II. And it doesn't go too much into the circus. And I think that's probably what most people were disappointed about. This was about the lives of certain people that were in here, how they got to be there and how the owner of this circus was just out to prove something to his family back home. I think he was from Boston or someplace, but he was just set to prove that he was like the greatest showman on earth and he didn't need the family business he didn't need the family money he wanted to build the best traveling circus with elaborate costumes elaborate decorations the steam train that that he had all the compartments all the carnival the circus pro um, entertainers were in there they all had like their own cars and things like that they lived as a family which is what um, my parents did when they were in their traveling circus and it centers around an illusionist Theo from Greek who made a deal with the owner of this carnival he was in a s sensational illusionist kind of like the uh, likes of Harry Houdini and um, his what you thought was his wife was pregnant at the time and so he made a deal that after the baby came, they would join join him. And as it turned out, the baby Lena had polio, and she had a lot of lot of health issues. Of course, back then it, we did not have the vaccines we had. It was so anyway. Part of the stipulation that if he joined this uh, carnival, the circus, that they would take care of all her medical bills, and they did. So he joins the carnival. Uh, Lena's mother is passed away and so he and Lena are on this. She's an exceptional, exceptional child. She is like the star of this book and uh, she's overcome so much with her polio. She's in a wheelchair. She gets bullied by the other carnival performance. She makes some friends but they're quickly to kind of cast her aside as they come to like different destinations that the car the the circus is in and they all get to go off the train and go on adventures she's pretty much left to herself there's a library in the train and she's into the medical field and she has a doctor on the train that helps her through a lot and they decide to do some um rare kind of medical procedures to try to help her walk again and so she's kind of making steps in that direction to gaining some strength in her legs so she's not paralyzed and she meets a boy in the train so everyone else is off um doing their traveling or whatever working the carnival circus in town and um as she passes the kitchen train the uh, part of the train there's a young boy on the floor and she can't get to him because she's in a wheelchair and she's calling for help, calling for help. And she knows the door to the train is open. It's winter, it's cold. So she falls off her wheelchair to kind of cover him until someone can come and help them. So anyway, she ends up back in the infirmary with him as well. And they just kind of get this friendship going. And because she's in the bed the whole time, he doesn't know she's got polio and that she is paralyzed and can't walk. And so when the time comes for her to leave 
uh, the infirmary. Um, she's terrified that now he's just going to put her aside. Her father, Theo, um, he is a Jewish boy. And of course, this is right as World War II, the Gestapo, the SS, they're making more and more stops as the train is traveling through Europe and just checking passports and checking everyone. And Lena's father, Theo, talks the owner into keeping the boy and to hiding his paperwork. And um, Theo is going to teach him how to be um, like his prodigy, another illusionist, and to keep him on the train because he's like the only friend to his daughter. And so they still continue this friendship. Later on, as World War II is continuing, and the um, owner of the circus is kind of letting some people, he's not happy with their performances, and he was hiding the fact that they were Jews, he's letting the SS people take them off the train. And so Theo wants to save his himself, his daughter Lena, and of course his prodigy. And so he devises a plan to get them off the train, which the owner finds out about, and he ends up turning the boys in, Theo and the boy into the Gestapo. So the Nazis have taken hold of him. Lena, of course, that's her life. She's got no life without these boys. She's still confined to a wheelchair. She's still doing different things to try to get some strength, but she can't do it on her own. The circus train ends up leaving and her dad and this boy are just, they're gone. She has no idea what's happened to him. She stays with the circus a little bit longer because she's got nowhere to go and the doctor still can help, is still helping her. Um, she had a tutor that um, her father was not happy with and um, he let her go, but she gets keeps in touch with this tutor in England and um, she helps her with some paperwork to get her into a school where she can continue learning about medicine and becoming a doctor. And the doctor has helped her. She is able to now be out of her wheelchair walk with a cane. Years have gone by. She hasn't heard from her dad or her friend. Um, and so she lives with these uh, the school teachers. She's been going to this prestigious school on a scholarship. And these people adopt her, assuming that, of course, her dad has most likely, you know, been murdered. Turns out they are in kind of like a pre-Nazi concentration camp where they have some of the workers there. Um, they're for entertaining what they call the troops and trying to keep spirits up. They're given kind of special treatments, like maybe there's only 20 of them in a room that's filled with cockroaches and bed bugs and everything else, no sheets. Maybe they get some bread, some water every day, and they're filled with the workers' um, pre-concentration camp that are doing all the work, getting hardly any food, they're dying, and when they've kind of outlived their usefulness that they're not able to work, that's when they kind of send them off to the concentration camps where we assume that that's where they are murdered. And, um, and it turns out that they offer these performances performers like they'll say they're going to have a year contract to entertain them and then at the end of the year they're free to go. It's not that way. At the end of the year they're going to be sent to the concentration camps to uh, be murdered as well. And uh, so anyway, Theo and this young boy devise a plan to escape during one of their greatest illusions ever. Alrighty, we're going to leave it there because I don't want to give any uh, spoilers. As they fight for their freedom, Lena, Lena fights for her medical knowledge, her degree, her graduation. Um, and it's just, it's a wonderful story. I loved it. Again, this had such terrible, terrible, terrible reviews online, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I'm so sorry this ran so long, but I might try to re-edit this and try to do this a little bit differently. Alrighty. So anyway, I want to thank you guys so much for stopping in and spending some time with me. And I appreciate you guys so much. So take care, everyone. Stay safe. Be kind. Be happy. Enjoy life. And we'll talk again soon. Bye, guys.